In the study that we've been doing in the field, what we've mainly been doing is just watching what's going on. We really don't really know much about what goes on with insects. You kind of see them flit past you, but you don't really know what their lives are actually like because they're so hard to follow. One of the things we like about crickets is that because they've got these burrows that they've put a lot of effort into and which they're terribly vulnerable without because they're liable to get eaten by robins and magpies and all sorts of things like that, we kind of know where they're going to be. And so we can point video cameras at the burrows and then we'll be able to film a cricket. So it's kind of an opportunity to find out about the lives of insects. A lot of grasshoppers and crickets and bush crickets uh, sing and in the UK we're particularly familiar with the song of grasshoppers and probably lots of people know that grasshoppers sing by rubbing their back legs against their wings. And crickets and bush crickets, which look a bit like grasshoppers but they tend to be a bit more chunky and the main distinguishing feature is that they have long antennae, antennae which are typically longer than the body. They actually sing in a slightly different way in that they rub their wings against each other. Generally insects have got two pairs of wings and in crickets and bush crickets their forewings are not used for flying. They're quite sort of crispy, rather rigid structures and they lift the forewings up and they rub them one against the other. They're always organised the same way round and the two wings are quite different. One of them has a little row of pegs on it in a little line called a file and the wing that's above that wing has a flattened resonating structure called a harp which the file rubs against and that causes the harp to vibrate and that's what makes the sound. Or in fact it was discovered um, not that long ago that in fact the, the noise we hear is not actually the resonation of the harp itself but actually of the tiny pocket of air that is caught between the two wings just as a tuning fork if you bang it it has a particular frequency that it rings at this pocket of air is always the same size and so it has a particular frequency and so that makes a particular tone so we'll hear a kind of trilling noise which is made by the vibrations that are set up in the wing. Most of the songs we hear in the animal kingdom are about sex and particularly in grasshoppers and crickets it's the males that sing so it seems likely that these calls carry some sort of information that allows females to make choices about which male they want to mate with and so the song is like the tale of the peacock the, the male that sounds the most tuneful may be the male that the female wants to mate with uh, cricket females have got ears to listen to the males and those ears are actually on their legs they're not um, you know on their heads or anything and they are connected directly to the kind of central nervous system of the cricket but even without going particularly through a lot of processing in the brain of the cricket if you play the noise of a male cricket to a female cricket on one side of the female the female will accelerate the movement of the legs on that side of her body so that she will involuntarily effectively immediately turn towards that sound and if you give it two different males it's kind of turning one way then the other way and you know it's not kind of doing loads of thinking about which male do I like well I'm not sure that well, do I like that one doesn't sound great to me it's like extremely objective beep on this side turn left beep on that side turn right sort of 
field crickets, Gryllus campestris, spring. So much of this is reflex. Placed on a polystyrene sphere, the female cricket scrambles towards a recording of the male, her legs pedaling desperately like an elephant on a ball, steering towards the bright itch of his song before her brain even has time to register the chur. Look at the crickets now, stacked up in boxes in this lab, the strip lights an incipient migraine, temperature steadily Mediterranean, fans and generators whirring. The cricket's prehensile antennae test the air, twirling like ribbons, retracting like whips, whirling, probing, sipping, strange tongues that latch to a particular taste. How receptive they are, how tenderly ready. The females hear the males stack in their Tupperware tenements and wheel and wheel again, pivoting towards them. We maybe think we're different, but in the hot box of the lab, a stranger turned the cricket in my palm, briefest graze of his finger on my skin, and I felt it then. I, who have been in love with the same brave man for years, felt it. Nevertheless, that giddy inward swoop, its pheromone wash, its compulsion, and I turned away confused by that sexual shiver, its tremble down my spine. My body now at forty a lit fuse, a gorgeous fluorescent yes, helplessly ready, touch me, I need to be touched. At night, I incandesce, my t-shirt soaked and clinging to my skin. Oh, my body is a beacon, it is panicking, it is screaming. It thinks we have not done enough to ensure the survival of the human race. It remembers plague, it remembers infant death. It knows we're running out of time and is extravagant, bountiful with eggs. I might have triplets, twins. As my cycle ends, my body mourns and takes me with her. Whole days, I want to curl around my two girls and hold them from the catastrophic world. Though of course, they won't be held and my body won't be reassured. Goaded by DNA, its will to merge and replicate, merge and replicate, its gorgeous living chain. Each individual lives a little bit longer than a year because it'll be laid as an egg in the early spring. It'll then go through its whole, the following early spring, it'll emerge as an adult. It'll then have a couple of months as an adult and then it'll die. Um, so it knows when winter is coming. It's not like an animal like um, a bird, which might live multiple breeding seasons or might not, and it might need to keep something in reserve in case it can survive the winter and have another brood of chicks the following year. Most of the insects that we have in the UK can only live one year, and there are some which sometimes live a few more years, and there are some which live many years. There are dung beetles that live a long time. Um, wood ants, for instance, or bees can live, you know, tens of years even, but generally they kind of have a, an annual life cycle, and that's what happens in our crickets. And does the sink, you talk about the, the, the males sort of just going for it with the singing, trying to sing to mate with as many females as possible, does that singing cost them? For sure, there's nothing in nature that's for free. So that singing must cost them a lot. It uses a lot of energy, and people have put 
crickets into devices that measure how much oxygen they use and you can see the cricket having to work hard just like someone on an exercise bike these wing muscles that they have are quite large you know they were in the evolutionary past mus muscles that they use for flying so it's a big um, potentially large set of hungry energy hungry muscles so it does use a lot of energy this singing and it's not surprising you think a cricket's pretty small and you can hear a cricket singing 100 meters away or something it makes a lot of noise so that may be one of the pieces of information that females get out of males this male must have some good genes which are going to go into my offspring because i can hear it from one field away or something so um in a way the song has to be costly for it to be potentially useful to females as a piece of information about the males. If the male could just produce a song for nothing, you haven't really learned very much about him. So this idea that the call has to have a cost uh, is an important part of how we understand how females could use the male song to choose a mate and to choose genes that will go into her offspring. But yeah, as a result of all that, you know the, the downside of that for males is they are likely to wear themselves out from this singing and you look at how much time males spend singing you see that they actually decline in how much they sing as they get older late summer when i returned to the lab that hot metal box parked like a caravan in the du maurier wing I'm too late even for the most persistent singers. There's a clear plastic bag stuffed with torn egg box habitats and dead crickets. The last few plastic tubs are waiting to be decanted, their inhabitants keeled over, shunted face down in corners, genuflect to some dark, immersive power, or plain damn tired. Back in March, the females have been laying eggs. I watch one insert the slim tube of her ovipositor into sand and hit the bottom of the plastic tub and felt it in my body, like some blunt uterine nerve, some dull touch. And now, spent shells, debris, while beside them in the tenements, the young are teeming testing the clear plastic edges of their boxes, scuttling, casting their skins and hardening off. And I begin to be sickened, I begin to be dizzied by the whole whirling circuit, these desperate spells of singing and fucking and laying and death, the males harp and file, sawing the tines of one wing across the other, its manic orchestra, all this appetite and instinct and secretion of eggs, to come to what? The survival of a particular way of being? A microchip passed through endless collaborations, gaining or losing significant traits, an endlessly augmenting dish, my single self sickens, understanding itself as slave to DNA. All the blood flesh agonies of love to end as a husk on your knees as I'm now on my knees. Something about how the crickets contract in death and the heat and my own lack of volition, desire and its plenitude. How I sleep fetally like the dead crickets, their legs drawn in as if invisibly trussed, and the twirling aerials of the young testing the limits of their boxes, and all of us in tenements, in limits, oblivious and captive, all of us messengers. We think we have meaning, but already biology has done with us. Yet look in this tarnished frame. This stalwart little girl could be either my mother or my daughter Rose. The same stance, the same rogue look. And I bear the message of both my grandmother's bodies. Think of that butterfly migration across oceans and deserts, completed in stages. 
how each butterfly undertakes a section of the journey, then lays its eggs and dies, and the caterpillars feed, pupate and hatch, then fly the next stage, a sort of relay across the honeyed distances, across time, on endlessly repatterning wings. How much I love the meadow, turning under them, its tapestry of grass and wort and vetch, stitching and re-stitching green, its endlessly mutating song. Mm-hmm.